blokes that, uh, that I know with an amazing stellar career with Carlton Football Club. Hall of Famer. We just figured out the first Lebanese-born footballer in the AFL. Played at the 95 Grand Final. So welcome, firstly. And tell me a bit about how awesome you actually are. Oh, well, uh, thanks for inviting me on this uh, amazing, uh, amazing show. Um, I'm glad I'm part of this in the very early stages of this because I know this is going to end up. This is going to skyrocket. This, this is, is going, going to end up pretty big, mate. This is going to go viral. I can, I can see that just like other parts of your life and career. Um, yeah, so it's uh, it's nice to be here. Um, as far as an awesome man, I don't know. I think that's for other people to judge. Judge me. I think <laughs> <laughs> I'm a decent person, but um, yeah, other people could make that judgment. Yeah, well, that doesn't matter. Yeah, that doesn't matter. What made you? first want to get into playing footy oh look it's I can't I can't really remember but probably if I had to put my finger on something it was when um, when we moved out to Australia with my mum and my sister we moved into East Brunswick where my mum still is there and family across the road from our house Italian family the uh, son there was the same age as me and he was a Carlton supporter and so I just followed with him and yeah we used to love listening to Carlton on the radio and going to the park and having a kick and um, that sort of ignited my interest, I think, when I was about six or seven yeah. at that stage and um, it just went from there really and um, it, was, it was interesting because even in those days, going to a primary school in East Brunswick, where predominantly most of the kids were Italian, the Greeks and Lebanese and Turks, not many people played soccer, it was sort of still mainly Aussie uh, was footy. Yeah. yeah, so that sort of, I think, had a bit of an influence as well. Yeah, yeah, which is, yeah, predominantly those sort of people do more soccer, but yeah. when you're in Australia, the one sport to play is AFL. Mm. And then, so then transitioning from growing up, growing up in the in the northern suburbs and, you know, being at all about footy, how dedicated and committed did you need to be to take it to the next level? Like, is that does that have to become your sole focus and driver? No, I never really thought about it that way. For me, it was more about, it was always about the dream. Yeah. It was always about, you know, I love Carlton and I always dreamed about playing for Carlton. And when I say dream, I um, literally dreamed about, you know, I'd wake up in the middle of the night with a sweat and think, no, oh, bloody hell, this is just a dream. Yeah. And it was so vivid for me. Yeah. And I'd wake up and I'd be very disappointed that it was only a dream. Yeah. Um, so it was more about that rather than me thinking about, oh, I've just got to work hard, I've just got to do this and I've got to do that. I think subconsciously I was doing that yeah. but I didn't actually I think I was wasn't mature enough to think oh Mel you got to get up you got to do these runs you got to do this exercise it was just always for me the bigger picture and what I could see out in front of me was the dream yeah. that was it yeah and I think subconsciously I just it just carried me to just carried me there so like visualizing through it because that's yeah, that's a massive thing that that, um, that Mark and I always do in business is we, you know, anything we want, we visualise it and then we go after it, but we, you almost, you almost get obsessed with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and as I said, it's I think soon as the day comes where you let go of that dream, yeah. you just finally realise or you just say, you know what, this is unrealistic. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's when I looking back now. That's when I think um, it's over. Yeah. And I, you know. You know, someone said to me early on, you know, I remember playing my first game in the under-19s. Back then it was under-19s reserves and seniors. And, you know, I just picked up the sun and looked at my name in the under-19 list. And I thought, oh, wow, this is, this is amazing. Yeah. And then I was just happy to play one game in the under-19s. That, that, that was my goal. Yeah. And then when I played a year, I thought, oh, God, if I could just play one game in the reserves, yeah. that would be unbelievable. Yeah. So I got a game in the reserves and then I thought, oh, Jesus, you know, I might have a chance here. And play one game in the seniors. So even at that stage, if I'd finished my career having played one game in the seniors, I, you know, before that, yeah. I would have been very satisfied. Right. Yeah. But moving through, you never stop yourself yeah. and say, oh, hold on a sec, Neil, you played one game in the seniors, I think it's time for you to stop. Yeah. You just sort of keep moving along. So for me, it's always been about, our dream's always been in the, in the, in the forefront. Yeah. I could see it. Yeah. It's never, it hasn't been, it was something that was never too far away. Yeah. Sometimes if it's, too unrealistic it's sort of yeah. I think can be unachievable yeah. so um, you know so I could sort of look back and say that was probably one thing for me uh, on, on a sort of a, I don't know if you call it a spiritual level or something that always kept me going so kind of just picking one goal 
sticking to that one goal, focusing on that, and then going after it. Yeah. Getting to that point, and then reassessing, going, let's go for another one. Yeah, and, and I didn't have many other interests at the time, and you know, growing up, and I was okay at school. I, you know, I wasn't you know terribly dedicated as far as academic is concerned. I did all right. I, you know, I wasn't much into women, and I had you know, I started losing my hair when I was about. 12 or 13 gradually yeah. and so I you know, lacked a lot of confidence with women yeah. so that was probably in hindsight a good thing because yeah. there was yeah. no distractions for me yeah. and just kept me focusing on just wanting to play footy and, and doing that so I didn't have too many other distractions yeah. apart from that. Yeah. Start a career though. Yeah, well, well, you know, one goal to the next goal to the next goal just kept smashing through it. It's easy now to sit back and look back and you know I can make that judgment now and say I'm happy that I've done what I've done because I don't want to get to a stage where I'm lying on my deathbed yeah. and looking back and reflecting and saying what I've actually done. Mm. Even if I, not necessarily because I've succeeded in certain things, it's just having a go at certain things. Yeah. And I've had a go at a lot of things. I've done so many variety of things and, um, and I feel like there'll be a bit of peace with me moving forward and you know I've obviously got I mean, everyone's got regrets I've got regrets I should have done this better I shouldn't have done that I should have bought that and you know why didn't I do that but it's it's part of it but you know I can always say that I've had a crack and that's one of the things that um, I certainly you know you don't think of back then but now you reflect and, and, and sort of keeps me going even now yeah and so when you're going through that though like the level of accountability that you hold yourself to how high is that? Is that level of accountability to keep pushing yourself and driving? And for me, it's a bit of a combination. You know, there are times when, you know, it's bizarre. I use this. <laughs> I use this and now we're talking about footy. Yeah. I use this example a bit, and I haven't told too many people this, but you know, when my before I started playing for Carlton, I used to have the dreams about playing for Carlton. Yeah. And my dreams were about me playing and dominating. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And they were really they were vivid. Yeah. And then, since I've retired, yeah. right, every now and again I'll have a dream about me playing for Carlton. Yeah. But the opposite happens. I dream about me really struggling. Really? Yeah. Really struggling. So mm. I'm trying to analyse that and thinking, well, it's interesting now because I've, I've, I've actually played nearly 200 games and played in the Premiership. Mm. And one of the things that I can take out of it is that I think deep down... I'd probably, you know, worked reasonably hard and, you know, I think I was blessed with a fair bit of talent and looking back now, if I could do it all over again, I could prob- I'd probably be more accountable mm. and I probably don't think that I worked as hard as I could. Yeah. I sort of relied more on natural talent yeah. and it's probably what that dream I think is telling me a bit. Yeah. Whereas I know sometimes I feel paralysed in that dream. I just can't pick up the ball. I can't handball the ball. It's amazing. Isn't and, it? and you wake up and think, oh, it's all right. You, you know, I've done it. There's nothing to worry about. But yeah, yeah it's, it's bizarre the, how the whole the thing is there. whole thing is sort of turned around. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. One thing that um, I'm always fascinated about with with you know elite sports people is, especially in a team environment, is that team camaraderie and you know, translated a lot into business and into life. Like being surrounded by the right people, being surrounded by people that are super focused, super positive, like how important is that? And, and there's obviously so many lessons that you would have brought through from the football life into your you know, career afterwards, like that team environment and, and all being on the same, in the same mindset, like what have you learned from that and how important has that been for you with your success? Oh, I mean, I've always I've said this before to other people that, you know, I think if you, you know, go through, um, not sure about other sports around the world, but certainly AFL, there's been a, a, quite a number of ex-AFL players over the time have been extremely successful in business. Mm. Um, you know, whether they've taken over that hard work ethic into business and into that. And, and as far as the team environment's concerned, I um, think that, that there's the key to a successful team is, is how many people in that team would you, disregarding talent or anything, how many people in that team would you take to the trenches with you? Yeah. You know, that's ultimately... Um, how many of those guys can you rely on Mm. Um, and how many of those guys when things are down you know and certainly in our era of of, of, you know we we played in a successful era at at Carlton and you know I I still remember many times you know whether it's half time or three quarter time we're down and our leaders of the team at the time Steve Kernahan and Greg Williams and all that would be very vocal about 
we're, we're, ne we're never out of it. This, we're still in it, you know, whereas that's really the key and it drives everyone else underneath them mm. um, and it brings everyone else along the journey. So, And also within that team environment, potentially how many people in that team could be their own independent leader. Yeah. And the more you have in that one team, the more successful the team you're going to have. Hundred yeah. percent. You know, it's it, it's, and we probably would have had, realistically, ten players in our team that could have captained any other team yeah. at the time. Yeah, yeah. Do you think that's that's a massive part of the success? Oh, absolutely. Because it's you're not the people that you're not relying on one person. Mm. You know, you're not relying on one person. If if you're in a, if you're in a game situation and you know a couple of your top players are down, mm. other people rally. You know, and you look at the current teams now, Richmond and all those teams, they've got that sort of, that characteristic where, you know, they, they're not relying always on that one player, although when that one good player does play well, it makes a bit of a difference. And, and we had it. And, you know, and, and, you know, it's, it's, whether it's the luck of the draw, you just have at that point in time in your life and, and that team, you have a lot of players who fit that bill. That really is one of the key driving forces, I think, for a successful team. Yeah, yeah. How, how does that translate into your life now, do you think? Like, you know, being around the team, the leadership skills and all that sort of stuff, because, you, you know, for me, we've known each other for a mm. while now, and you, you're very much a natural leader. You can identify things and just run with it and... Yeah, look, I mean, obviously I was involved in a restaurant for a long time, and, and one of the things I used to sort of pride myself on was was being able to identify other team members, mm -hmm. get them on board, and that's ultimately, I think, what it's about. And if you look at any organisation in the world, whether it's business or social or whatever it is, sport, the success of that team really depends on, uh, really, the, the, the selection criteria. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. it all starts and ends with the people in charge of choosing who is involved in that organisation. Yeah. Right? So, you know, you get someone on board, and they're amazing, your organisation's amazing. If they're not, who's to blame? Mm. I mean, do you blame them? Yeah. Or ultimately, do you blame the person who's choosing? And, and, and for me, that's a key factor. And I always used to, you know, I'd get staff to come in and they want a job and, yeah, all right, come along, yeah. make me a coffee. Mm. And I could tell within five minutes if, 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 they, if they had it or they didn't have it. Mm. Um, Whereas I'm not saying I'm the guru, but there, there's other cafes that might have got that same person and said no, or vice versa. Yeah. Got a person that I would have said within five minutes, you want the answer, mm. and other places would have employed them. Yeah. So, you know, and the same in sport. Yeah. Someone comes along and say, yep, I'm going to recruit that guy, I'm going to take him at pick number four or five or ten. Mm. He ends up being a gun and, and others don't. So it's... Um, I think it all starts with the people running that organisation and their selection criteria. Yeah. You can't really ultimately blame, say, well, that's a, it's a hopeless cafe. Yeah. Every, every single waitress is hopeless here and the cooks, are, the food's terrible. Well, I mean, who's to blame for that? Mm. You know? Well, it's a team, yeah, it's, it's, Correct. Right, it's a team environment. Yeah. Everyone, if everyone's working together towards one goal or in that really good environment and they've got that good energy, Things just flow and things just yeah. work and everyone knows their job. Same as when you're playing footy, everyone knows their job and knows what they've got to do and they mm. smash through it. What would, uh, what would you tell 17-year-old Mill if you can go back and have a 10-minute chat with him? What would the conversation consist of? Besides you're a good-looking bloke. Yeah. Um, probably on a few levels. On a, on a sporting level, I'd probably say that if I worked a little bit harder and just didn't rely on some natural talent, mm -hmm. I probably could have could have achieved more, yeah. I'd say. I, I definitely would say that. Yeah. Um, and I look at some of my teammates who probably did that yeah. and um, were amazing. On a personal level, probably would say that sometimes I probably need to be a bit more sensitive not to say I'm mean or anything like that, but <laughs> looking back there, you know, there was probably, you know, early on, um, you know, having grown up in a Lebanese family, my dad was quite a domineering sort of European family. Yeah, you know what it's like, and um, um, doing that on a, on a business level, probably, although there were things that I did that 
I had fun with. I would probably advise myself to um, be a bit more cautious with some of the things that I did. Um, some in terms of some of the investments, although some of the things I did has kept me have worked out quite well. Yeah. But they're just little, you know, not not huge amounts, but just little little things like that where, you know, where you, you've got the hindsight of re- reflecting back and saying, oh, you know, if I if I was different here or different there, yeah. um, sort of as far as the personal issues are concerned, I think it's a bit more about. For me, I was never able to. You know, my wife would always say that I don't express my feelings a lot. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Coming up with that sort of those issues, so. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> And I, you know, I suppose she's taught me over the last 20 years or so, yeah. just to open up a little bit more. Yeah. So how have you gone with that? Yeah, it's it's good, and I've learned, and I've learned to sort of, you know, you know, coming from that um, ethnic background, you sort of uh, it's hard for it's hard for us to to walk away. Mm. You know, something said, you know, it's it's. So it's good to have that argument. And then sometimes I look at other people. Yeah. And I have a lot of respect for situations where you see interactions between partners or friends or whatever and, and disagreements and then just being able to have that, you know, the coolness and just to... Walk okay. away, take five, come back and... Or just agree to disagree but or something. that's part of being European. Yeah, yeah. You know, no, that's right. are pretty hot-headed. I mean, you yeah. like a bit, a bit of an argument. But ultimately, as you get older, when you, when you look back, Daniel, it actually doesn't matter. No, you know what I mean? At the end of the day, half the things you worry about just they don't matter. At the time, they feel like a big, big problem. As that, I don't know who, 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 who well, they try to who made that. I don't know which person made that famous quote. They said, "At the end of the day, we're all going to be buried, yeah. or at the end of the day, we're all going to be dead." Yeah. So yeah. you know, so that's let's not waste any negative energy on. How does it serve you at the time? Oh, is it promoting good energy? Or is it yeah, that's bad right. Energy? That's right. It's just you're just young, and you know, you learn, and it's part of. You know, you know, trying to teach my son that as well, you know, and, you know, they, you know, at that age and my daughter, they think they know it all, yeah. you know, well, you but it's hard to, it's hard to convey that so just, okay, you just, as time goes on, you just learn. Mm. It's at every generation, it's very difficult to, mm. to tell a 17 year old, you're a 17 year old self that this is, this doesn't matter or just do this differently. Yeah. Who were some of your biggest influences <clears throat> from um, then and, and now, I suppose? Look, probably, once again, you know, it's, it's from a sporting point of view, you know, there, there were a few guys that played for Carlton at the time who were my idols and I really looked up to them. You know, guys like Wayne Harms and, you know, played, you know sort of greats of the club. You know, there were other players from other clubs that I, that I idolised, like Robbie Flower who played for Melbourne, who was, who was a superstar player. Yeah. Um, they sort of kept me going and, and, and driving me towards achieving that goal. You know, early on, early on in my career, a guy like Colin Kinnear, who coached Carlton and was a chairman of selectors at Carlton and was a great believer in me. Yeah. You know, David Parkin, these guys. And sometimes it just takes people just to, to believe in you, you know, whereas someone different mightn't have had the same vision. Yeah. And, and that... And tuning, that, tuning into that is a really important part. So, if you, you know, like you said before, when you're saying about the natural talent, you, you know... Can you get, and I'm sure that you've seen it, I've seen it with, with heaps of people that have a natural talent and they just rely everything on their natural talent and they don't want to do any of the other work because naturally they know, well, I'm just gifted, mm. so I don't need to do any more, any, any more because I'm just good. And, and having those other people, does that drive you harder? Yeah, and that's what... Because they're investing in you, right? Well, that's essentially what happened to me, really, and I started to sort of <laughs> career off and, and then I went through a bit of a, probably not second, third year in my career, I went through a bit of a rough trot and one of my other coaches, you know, I was really struggling under um, and I started to retract a bit and my performances were terrible. Yeah, you um, had a pretty big injury, didn't you? Yeah, my first game, but when I came back and I just sort of, you know, was lacking confidence, but this particular coach was, was trying to get the best out of me, but maybe in a different way. And it sort of got to the stage where it nearly broke me. Mm. Um, and I'd be going out there and I was playing really sort of into football. I, was, I was, wasn't taking risks or anything like that because I was scared of making a mistake. And, and then there was a turnover of coaches and new coach came in and, and um, his attitude was completely different. 
and it just changed my whole psyche. Yeah, just how, how do you? I mean, because that's a massive thing, isn't it? And and you know, there's I know that there's probably a really big focus on now, but the mental part of it and going through. I'm sure that you've been through anxiety and depression, and and especially because it was your knee injury that you did mm. in your first game. Yeah, mentally, how did that feel, and how do you how did you overcome that? Because you were out for the whole season. Yeah. Yeah. Look, you know, coming where I've come from, where you know I spent my whole life dreaming about playing for Carlton and, and then getting to your first game in front of you know 70,000 people and literally the first two minutes of the game going for a mark falling down and doing my knee and then two days later being in hospital yeah. with the prospect of being out for 14 months you know my thoughts were I can't believe this this is a bloody nightmare mm. I've just started my career yeah. all my dreams have come true it's over it's all over and that's what I actually thought. I thought my whole career was over at the time because back then, those sort of the injuries were, you know, I, I did two ligaments, chipped the bone from the knee, and, and um, you know, they were a long time. But once again, it's, it's the old, what if, you, what if you find yourself in the bush by yourself? What do you do? Do you just curl over and die? Yeah. You know, and, and for me, it was, okay, I've done my knee, and, you know, I was young, I was 19 at the time, and... Um, and in hindsight, maybe that was a blessing for me because I was quite a skinny at the time, and I spent 12 months in the gym and yeah. built myself up and and got back. And um, you just you just do it, you know. It's just one of those what things. What about the mental things? Like, what do you tell yourself along that road? Because it's it's you know, I know that it sounds easy to just say, yeah, okay, I just went and spent some time in the gym and then I was good. But surely there's a lot of mental. Oh, look, that's also, that comes Challenges. with, so yeah, there is, and that comes with the support you get from yeah. around you in the club, and obviously, you know, for me, some of the things that happened at the time that reinforced in my mind that, you know, I was obviously a valued member of that organisation, you know, that I got paid for the rest of the year, mm. which is a big thing, even though I wasn't playing in the seniors, the club, you know, I was going to university at the time, you know, Monash, and, I didn't know well, I was a very smart man. What did you do at uni? Ah, uh, well, I did. Uh, what did I do at uni? I, well, I wanted to be a phys ed teacher, secondary oh. school phys ed teacher, and a long story. But I ended up uh, doing two years of uh, science at um, Rosen College, which was sort of across the road from Monash at the time, and then transferred to phys ed, and and I actually didn't finish the course. I just sort of left. After three years, oh, you would have been the greatest phys ed teacher Victoria's ever seen. Probably, but how did I not know this? Well, the, what about if you do it now? Problem is, I, I start. I've got a taste of. I've got a taste of money. Yeah. So <laughs> I was working. Teachers part, don't get much. I was working part time with a mate of mine who was in the building industry, and, and I was making a bit of money in commissions and stuff like that. And I just thought, oh, you know what? As much as the lifestyle might be okay, yeah. this is not for me. Yeah. You know. So that, that's how it all how, how it all ended up. But we get that point about you know mentally, for me it was the support around you and um, you know and even then the club would give me. I was they said to me no you you take it. I was living in East Brunswick and they said you take a taxi to Monash University every day to school. So they pay for me. Because yeah, wow. so all these little things to keep, to just to keep, and is that to at, keep your brain active and not be sitting at home and well, getting depressed and correct? And it was it was that absolute support. Yeah. Whereas if they sort of said, uh, you know what, they they wouldn't contact you, they, they didn't give you all that support. It, it would be harder for players, and there would be people in those situations. So mm. I think if you can't do it just yourself, yeah, you know there has to be that support. So for me, it was a combination of. Obviously, family, mum, and, and um, you know the, the footy club was amazing to me. Yep. And obviously, unfinished business. Mm. It was really, you know, I'd, I'd play five minutes of the game yep. that I, in my mind, had built up for twenty years. So it wasn't really. It was the goal, but it wasn't. You didn't live out the goal, I suppose. Well, I got a taste of it, and I thought, you know what? One more. Yeah, and I thought, well, and you know, being young, and and then you sort of. Then when, it, when time comes and you start getting into the work, then you really start to get motivated about wanting to go back there. What about um, when you were playing? How did you let off steam at the end of the year? How were the oh, footy trips? Look, 
It was, it was pretty subdued. It was, it no, it was a magical. It was a magical time back then. It was a, look in every era, and I'm sure if you talk to the guys in the 1930s who played footy, or the 50s, or 60s, or 70s, every era, they've all got their own stories, and they've, they'll all say that their era was the best. And you know, certainly in our era, um, I refer to the golden era, 20 or 30 years between the sort of early 80s and late 90s or whatever, and. Um, you know, we, we played hard, we worked hard during the season, and, you know, if you didn't make the finals, if you made the finals, whatever happened, you always went overseas. Yeah. And it was every player. Mm. And it was just a mandatory thing, you know, the captain of our team would say, everyone has to be involved, unless you can't do it for whatever reason, but usually 95% of the players would block up and we'd pick a different destination. And we'd spend two weeks together, Yeah. And we'd go out together every night, we'd hang around, it was a beach environment, we'd be hanging out at the beach. Um, and it was amazing. It was probably, apart from the actual physical playing of the game and the success, it was my fondest memories of, of being you know, away with a group of guys that you train hard with and just to be able to relax, no one knows who you are there. Let go of everything and just... Let go of everything. You know, you just wake up whatever time you want and just do whatever you like and you know, we're all respectful and... Um, What's one really good story you've got for me that you can tell? There's probably a heap you can't tell me. Look, there's... Because um, you're a good story. Yeah, you? yeah. Look, one of my best mates, um, Luke R. Sullivan, spent a number of years at Carlton. Funniest guy I've ever met. He, uh, I would say that during my time at Carlton, and you know, you would ask other players, that his presence at the club really enhanced everyone else's enjoyment yeah. of the time there, through the ups and downs. and. And he was just a prankster and he was a really clever guy, you know, witty. And this is the year that we won the grand final in 95. Yeah. So, so you know, we've been in, we've won the grand final, we've had a week or so in Melbourne, just partying out every night. And then we had our overseas trip organised to Vegas and LA. Yeah. So we went to Vegas and then we went to LA and, and we're all just knackered, you know, which is it's, it's, it's three or four weeks in. Yeah. So we're sitting in this uh, cafe down at Santa Monica Boulevard and we're all sitting down having lunch. I don't know, there's 30 of us or whatever it was. And Luke said, oh, I'm just going. I said, where are you going? He said, oh, so I'm just there. So he just walks out. So about an hour later, <clears throat> we're sitting in the cafe and I hear all this commotion out in the street, and Santa Monica Boulevard was like a, there were no cars there, it was just sort of like a walk through. It's foot traffic. Yeah. yeah. And there was this guy climbing this tree in the tightest Superman suit, <laughs> right? And he was climbing this it tree. Was, anyway, it was outfit. Okay. full on Superman outfit with, you know, covered head, the whole thing. So you couldn't see his face or anything. And um, he, he comes down and he starts to do the all the, all the Superman, uh, the, Spider-Man, sorry, oh, Spider-Man, Spider-Man, yeah. Spider-Man um, actions, and then all of a sudden, I mean, he starts walking towards us, mm. and then I knew it was Luke, right? <laughs> and he comes in, goes in the cafe, sits down, pulls his head thing off, yeah. and continues to drink, and <laughs> and these are the, these are the kind of things that he used to do constantly on trips, yeah. constantly on trips, and even in, you know at the end of the year in Melbourne, and and it was just full on entertainment the mm. whole time, and. There was another story where he, he uh, we had someone's 21st at the Rathdown Tavern, one of the players' parents used to own it. And um, anyway, Luke didn't turn up that day. And you know, I think, what the hell, he hasn't turned up to the 21st, everyone's supposed to be there. And he was, there would have been like 150 people in this pub. Yeah. And about, you know, late at night, this guy walks in and they had a pool table there and they had a, like a pool table that had like a, Tim the top on top of us, uh, you know, they put yeah, yeah, glasses yeah. and whatever. And this guy's walked in, in the nude, right? <laughs> Completely nude. Walks in, packed pub, 150 people. Yeah. Goes to the pool table, has a suitcase with him. Yeah. And it was like one of those old style 1930 suitcases. Yeah. Puts the suitcase on the pool table, flicks it open, pulls out a toothbrush, holds the toothbrush up like this. And it, all this time, everyone's watching him. Puts the toothbrush back in, closes the suitcase, walks out, never saw him again. <laughs> That's what he used to do. 
That's amazing. Yeah. They're the kind of things he used to do. Yeah. Just amazing mind. If so, only we had, uh, only had a mate like that. Oh, you know, and he'd be, you know, he'd do things where we'd be in a London pub at a thing and, you know, one particular London pub had like a piano and, you know, in the middle of the, you know, us being there, he decides, well, goes into the toilet, strips down completely nude once again, <laughs> goes to the piano, sits down and starts playing the piano in the nude. <laughs> you know? And we just sit there and, and it's all... It sounds like Marco. Yeah. Like that. And just, it's all, it's all part of, you know... He, but it breaks he, it up too, doesn't it? Oh, so it's not serious it's just all the con- time. Well, it's just constant entertainment. Because you need that, like, you know, especially being in a, in a high, like playing footy at that level, I'm sure it's a pretty high stress yes, environment. You yeah. need it. I mean, yeah. you need it. And, and the thing is, there's not many personalities like that. To have someone who's leading that way mm. also complements all the other stuff, you know. And, and as I said, we all cherish that, that, you know, that involvement that he had there. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and the, the, you know, Luke's had his own challenges, mm. you know in his own life and he yeah. still is having his own challenges mm. right mm. but you know he got that amazing mind and do you still have that camaraderie with with the guys that you had like the leadership team and meeting up and you know still networking with them and keeping that same energy with them yeah we we decided all the year most of my close friends we all retired at the same time yeah and we're all great lovers of golf and the year after we retired, we decided we we're going to start a golf trip every year, and um, it's been going for 23 years or whatever. And you know, every year we go into state, we've been overseas a few times, three or four nights, and we all love our golf. And we play golf, we drink, we eat, we love our food, yeah. Um, and it's just a great combination. And, and you know, we look forward to every year. Some players we see once a year on that trip, yeah, and it's like we haven't no, the beat, got that same yeah. thing, yeah. Um, and my close friends. We still catch up, you know, our wives are friends, we go away together. Yeah. And it's um, it's great to be able to do that because w- when you play together for 15 years, yeah. all of a sudden, just because you're not playing footy together, does that mean you don't see each other again? Yeah. You know, it's a bit like if you worked with someone for 20 years and you decided to retire, decided to go somewhere else and you've had this relationship. You've got a bond. Like, yeah. It's almost like a, a marriage in a sense to certain people, isn't it? Correct. And that's, and that's how we Connected are. for life. Yeah. So there's, you know, there's a, there's a number of us closely, you know, yeah. tied in. So it's, um, it's great. It's great to be like that. Yeah. Do you think that um, being from, uh, you know, European family as well, you brought a bit of that bond and connectivity with you? Yeah, look, because I mean, you know it's very much about you know breaking bread with people and sitting at tables and creating you know it's 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 a really big thing for yeah. Them. Look, I mean, I was sort of uh, I'm not going to say I was the leader in many areas like that, but I was very influential when it came to deciding where we went on overseas trips. Mm. You know, I was obviously you know I just I was founded the golf tour of trips. So I was very much you know, involved in that sort of thing and, and early on in, in my career and it went on for nearly the whole career was, you know, I'd be constantly players coming back to my my mum's house, my parents' house yeah. and she'd put on a massive Lebanese feast, mm. you know, skewers and chicken wings and, and all sorts. That's amazing, like, you know, yeah. break and break and, and, and a big meal together. And my mates would come over and, you know, you know, the wog mates I had understood, but then, you know, the Aussies had come around yeah. thinking, what the hell is this? Yeah, we well, like, on, yeah. is there more food? Yeah, no, there's more <laughs> food coming. So that was a good way to do that. So, it was, uh, yeah. It's a different way of bonding. Yeah, I certainly it? brought some of that to the club, yeah. What about that now? What are you doing now? Um, as in... Career-wise, life Career-wise, oh, oh, look, I sold my... I was involved in hospitality, for, as you know, for 27 years and... Um, around the corner here in Fitzroy. Yeah. I love that part of my life. Probably overstayed my welcome a little bit in the end. And I uh, decided I just I just needed a change mentally. I just needed a change away from employing 30, 40 people, um, having to be on call on weekends and nights. Because it's and a stuff. tough gig. It's a tough being gig. Being hospitality. Yeah, it's a tough gig. And, probably um, tougher than playing footy. It probably was, yeah. yeah. And now I've working as a business development manager for Harvey Norman Commercial, which is a commercial division of the, the, the national business. And we basically, we our clients are builders and developers, people like yourself and um, non-retail clients. Yeah. Um, you know, we're the biggest commercial division in Victoria and, and I'm actually l- loving 
the change. I'm loving the fact that I can go to work Monday to Friday. I'm at home all night, every night. My family, weekends, which I never had weekends. Mm. And until I started three years ago, I never, I never had Christmas at all for 27 years. Oh, I you know, I was always that was the busiest time of my my year. Mm. Um, I could never go away at that time. So you don't really realise it until you're out of it. Yeah. And thinking, oh, what was I doing all those years? You know, so new phase of my life. I'm, I'm enjoying, still being me, still thinking. Never, when I say never satisfied, I'm happy with what I'm doing, but my mind's always ticking over. In terms of challenging yourself. Yeah, what I'm, what what, what else do I want to do? I think that's well, a Lebanese, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. I yeah. think you know, and and, and We're maybe a dealer. Maybe just backing yourself as well. Yeah. That's the other thing. Just well, life's sort of, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, the just, challenges are fun, aren't they? Just backing yourself and saying, okay, well, well I've done that in part of my career. I've, I've played footy, I've run a business, I've done this, I've done that. Now I'm in this. Is, is this, is this, um, is this going to feed my soul yeah. for the rest of my life? Yeah. Um, and you've got an amazing team over there too, it happened. Oh, it's amazing. It's amazing. It's going to feed my soul. Yeah. Am I going to get back? Am I going to be in a situation as I mentioned earlier in 20 years time I'm the deathbed and thinking you know what, what what did you stay there for so long what did you do that for why didn't you try this why didn't you try that so if you're not thinking like that mm. if you're not thinking like that I think there's something missing yeah even yourself you could have the most successful business mm. you, your construction company in 10 years time could be biggest in Melbourne yeah but if you're not constantly thinking about well if you're not fulfilling yourself correct constantly chasing something like that like, you know if people are constantly chasing Money, for me, I always think if you're constantly just chasing money, mm. you're always going to be chasing it because you're never going to be satisfied with that dollar. Yeah, and for me, it's, it's it, look, for it's me, not about the money, is it? it it's, mm. look, it's obviously, in some ways, it's about the money because... But the money becomes a tool or a vehicle. It, it has to be a bit about the money in terms of being able to do what you want to do and support yourself and move on. Mm. But, you know, it's a bit like if you're using the footy analogy, you don't go and start playing footy and say, I want a million bucks a year. Yeah. You think, well, I just play because I enjoy the game, yeah. and and it will take care of the the rest the of rest it. Will take care. You know, it'll just happen. You know, you're you doing do something you love. You're doing well. Oh, what is it? You're doing well. You know, mm. the rest will take care of itself. Yeah. Um, so for me, it's it's not about you know how much more money can I earn or anything like that. It's about you know, what I'm doing now. I'm enjoying. Yeah. But you know, you'd be lying to yourself if you said I've got the blinkers on. Yeah. Right, I've got the blinkers on. I'm not thinking about anything else. Every now and again, thoughts will come into your head. Yeah. What if I did this? What if I did that? Keep challenging yourself. Yeah. That's what life's about. Whatever. It? I don't know where... I mean, I would never have thought myself I'd be in this situation yeah. Yeah. five years ago. Yeah. No way. Yeah. Or 10 years ago. So who knows where I'll be in three or four years' time. You know, yeah. I'm the view. you just got to keep challenging yourself, as you said. And, and um, you can't lock out these thoughts yeah. that ever come in because... You know, it is what it is, you know, it's, mm. you know, you're... Uh, what, what about, um, tell me a bit about Glenda Bailey. Well, Glenda... I've got to lead into to Glenda. Yeah, well, Glenda, um, I've known for many years, actually. I, I met her when I was at the Fitz, probably, God, nearly 30 years ago. She was working for, a, um, she was, at the time, she was working for Ariston, which is an appliance company. Yeah. And... I met her because I bought an oven from the house yeah. and then she was working for a stainless steel company. I needed some stainless steel for the restaurant. Yeah. And then over the last sort of 25, 30 years, um, you know, as she's progressed in her business, you know, she'd bring clients into the restaurant and, and, you know, some years I'd see her once a year, other times I'd see her two or three times a year. And, and um, we sort of, um, as I said, it was, wasn't, I wouldn't say it was a terrible, close, close, Friendship, but it was, um, you know, it was it was a long time, yeah. and this is how that sort of job came about, really, because I mean, she's amazing. Woman, yeah. Oh, amazing! Yeah. So we've sort of been, you know, friends um, for for a long time, and it's ironic that you know, I sort of, I'm, I'm working there now. But what about because uh, I know that you were on the front bar two, three, mm-hmm. four weeks ago, something like that. Was there a promise from Glenda about something? And I wanted to hear if she's. <laughs> If she's held up to this promise, what was the promise, and has she held up to it? Look, you, 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 you know that I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, you know, keen golfer. Yes. I love my golf. Yep. And I've been trying to convince Glenda to buy a, a membership at the National for the business. Yep. Right. Not for me personally, but for the business, so we can go and take clients in the table. Absolutely. Um, she's not a golfer, so um, it, it's been a bit, bit of a challenge. Um, 
So I uh, made up this thing in my mind <laughs> that I didn't tell anyone what I was going to say. And I uh, <clears throat> said on the footy show, as a lot of people would have heard, that right at the end that Glenda was having a go at me because I would never get invited onto the front bar. Yeah. She said, you're a has-been. You're, <laughs> you're a, no one knows who you are anymore. Because I said to her last year, I got invited on the front bar. She said, no, you didn't. I said, I didn't. And then I, then I made up a story. I said, okay, I bet you I'll be on the front bar in the next 12 months. She goes, no, you won't. I said, I bet you I will. Yes. And then we made the better bet. If, if I am, you've got to buy me a golf membership, the national a business and golf membership. Yeah. If I don't, I'll take a pay cut. Yeah. And um, so... It was all made up, right? Yeah. Um, and she keeps saying now, she goes, you just made up that story. I said, no, no, I didn't make up the story. We had a beat, you just can't remember. Right? <laughs> so I think she's a bit confused about it. <laughs> so anyway, it's a you know, it's work in progress, work in progress. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it hasn't arrived yet. No, well, we can't, it's locked. Well, yeah, it can't go locked. off, so the, uh, when the dust settles, mm. I'll uh, be the national. I'll up the ante a bit with her and, and, and you know, a lot of people keep contacting and saying, have you, have you got that membership yet? <laughs> <laughs> so she feels... She's, she's feeling the pressure. Well, I don't know. She doesn't feel the pressure. She's pretty cool. Pretty pretty cool woman. So it's, uh, yeah, but anyway, I'll keep working on it because yeah. uh, I think it could be good for us. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and what do you say to... Um, the people that are coming through, they're in their teens and they're, and they're going into their either careers or sporting careers. What's the what's some advice that you would give to people going into that? Um, look, if I go back to the point I made earlier, I think you just got to, you know, anyone who's got wanting to do something that they love, um, you just got to, you got to follow that dream, you got to have that dream close enough where you can see it and visualise it. Mm. Um, um, and for me the other stuff just happened naturally you know the working hard and the doing extra work and all that stuff yeah, to do that. Committed to that yeah I mean that, that has to go with it you can't just have a dream and not being able to do that but, but the main thing is don't lose focus or belief because you know everyone's in a position where they can achieve whatever they want to achieve yeah. you know we can all wake up one morning and say you know what I'm done with this. I've had enough of what I'm doing. I'm going to actually try something. Else. No one's stopping anybody doing anything. Yeah. Whether you want to, as a 50-year-old, you decide, I want to be a lawyer, yeah, I'm going to go it. and study. If yeah. you end up being a lawyer at 70, you end up being a lawyer at 70. When, you, when you do commit to it, it, you know, is it a lot about pushing through and not quitting? It's, and just keep, go through those real challenging times and just keep pushing. I think I think there's a lot to do about that, and I think it's also a lot to do with the mindset of of, of most people don't actually think they're right. they they can do it. Mm. That's the biggest thing. Like I said before, it's hard to come from seeing it as a dream to think, "Well, shit, this is just a dream," and turning that into a correct. And most people think, "Me? Surely not me." Yeah. Can I can I be that person, or can I end up doing this? Yeah. And. That's the biggest restriction I think people have is feeling like giving yourself a limitation. Correct. Yeah. Why? Why isn't it me? And you know, if you go back to when the Bulldogs won the premiership a few years ago in yeah. 2016, you know, one of the things was why not us? Yeah. That was one of the things I said. Why not us? Mm. You know, and it's a good point. Like, you know, why you but not me? Mm. Um, and what is the restriction? I mean, what is the restriction? If, well, if you want to be, if you want to be a lawyer, mm. as I used an example again. What is your restriction? Mm. Is it intelligence or is it just work, hard work? And what's intelligence? I mean, just learn the stuff, yeah. right? And, and you can do it. It's just a limitation you give yourself, isn't it? And Correct. It's that. And, and, you know, I think one of the biggest things that like you keep saying is visualising and seeing it in your mind every single moment, every spare moment you've got. Keep visualising it, keep visualising it, keep seeing it, keep seeing it, keep dreaming it. Absolutely. And, and, you know, it's even sports people, you know, like there'd be, there's a lot of footballers that I've played with and against that, you know, I knew as young footballers mm. that in my view weren't terribly talented footballers, but they just worked their ass off. Yeah. They worked their ass off and ended up becoming really good team members and really good players in, in teams, yeah. right? Yeah. You know, they're and, committed and they're focused. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, and, you know, interesting point you just made then about the visualisation thing and there was, um, I'm not sure, if, I mean, I know exactly who it was, but it was a famous high jumper and, and um, 
I think one person questioned him one day and said, why do you take so bloody long to jump? Yeah. He goes, because I kept, I kept hitting the bar. Yeah. So he was sort of standing there, just visualising him. Seeing himself do it. Go over the bar. Yeah. And he goes, I just kept hitting the bar, kept hitting the bar, and I just waited for that time. And it was, and it's, and it's true. You know, if you don't see yourself in that position, um, you know, and being realistic, Daniel, you've also got to have the physical capabilities in some areas to be able yeah, to achieve absolutely. certain things. Yeah. But that's a physical thing. But when it comes to other things... Because a lot of know, it can be more mental. Like if you, you know, you can look at someone who's, who's lined up in front of goal, you can look at the way they've positioned their body, and a lot of people, before they even make that kick, you can say, he's going to miss it. Yeah. And, and that person, you know, you, you can speak from experience. Being in that position, you might have all these things going on in your head, the crowd, the mm. this, the that, and you've already doubted yourself out of it before you've done it. So, so mentally, when you're doing that, you've got to be really clear about what your result has to be too. Yeah? Absolutely, you know, and, and, and as I said, it's, it's really only, you're only limited by what you in your own mind think you can achieve. Yeah. You know, and you and I have had a discussion in the past about when you first started your business and yeah. when I had the restaurant, you'd come in and, yeah. you know, interfaces in the early stages and we'd often have a joke about interface is going to be a powerhouse of a thing. Now, you know, without joking, you look at how far you've come in five years. Four years. It's four, four years. Yeah. It's unbelievable, mm. right? And uh, if we're sitting in my cafe, me making you an amazing coffee, Which, and I said to you in four years' time, you're going to be doing 15, 20, 30 million dollar jobs, you, you, you would have laughed at me. Or yeah. you, you might have laughed at me because mm. you're always one of the most positive people I've met. Yeah. But, you know. Other you're, people are like, come on. Correct. So, because you know, for you, there's no limitation. No. Why well, give yourself a limitation? You've Correct. This amazing life to live. There's so much magic in it. Take everything you can get. Absolutely. And and just go hard for it. Yep. Go hard for it. One last question that we ask everyone: What is your favourite pasta dish? My favourite pasta dish is probably I'd have to say seafood linguine. Mate, <laughs> mate, the one that they used to make at the Fitz was often there. Well, that was, good. that was one of the best linguinis. Was that Callum that made it? Yeah, yeah. Well, he didn't invent it, but he used to, he used to make it. But um, yeah, I love just a good, simple seafood linguini. Yeah. Talking about the, the, the pasta dish, can I have you got time for me just to say one more thing? Of course I do. So, there was a, when I opened the bar, as you know, the bar at the Fitz, yeah. food critic came in from the sun. Because mm. I had like a Middle, <laughs> Middle Eastern tapas bar up there, food inspired. And he wanted to review some of the food or just talk about it. Anyway, so I just got chatting to him and, and uh, said to him, look, in all your years you've been, you know, what's the best meal you've had? Or, you know? So he told me this story about this um, dish that someone had told him about in Italy. There's a place about an hour out of Rome. And he said, you've got to go and try this pasta. It's unbelievable pasta. Mm. He said, really? He said, so next time he was in Rome, he went and found this joint. Yeah. And he said, I've rocked up to this joint about an hour out of Rome, walked in, there was no one in the joint, yeah. said there was a, what seemed to be a, a, a father and son sitting on a table eating. Yeah. And I walked in, it must have been during a, like maybe a siesta period or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. And they looked back as I walked in, they looked at me, didn't say anything, and looked, kept eating their food for another three minutes. Typical Italians. Typical Italians. <laughs> anyway, I finished and I went up to him and said, yeah, and he said, I've heard about this dish, I want to try this dish. Yeah. So, right, so he sat down and he had it. I said, what was it? He said it was like a, a handmade linguine. Yeah. And all it had was cracked pepper, yeah. parmesan, yeah. olive oil. That's it. Yeah. That's the dish. Yeah. I said, really? And he said, I said well, um, how was it? He goes, Mill, it was the best bloody pasta I've ever had in my life. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. He yeah. said, I don't know what it was. It was the type of parmesan they used, the pepper, the way they infused it with the Just olive oil. The simplicity of it. Mm. So then, when he told me that story, I got Callum to recreate it. it. To recreate it. Yeah. And it was amazing. Yeah. And I, the next six months, I had it nearly every second. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it just shows you the simplicity of a dish like that. Keep it simple. We say that around here all the time. Correct. Like kiss theory. Keep it simple, stupid. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Because if you don't keep it simple, you're making it complicated. Yeah. And all you're doing is complicating every part no, of your life. I 100, 100. You know, believer in that. Absolutely. Well, there you go. Mill Hannah, big Mill Hannah on the show. Biggest name in Melbourne at the moment, Mill Hannah. Thanks for coming on board, mate. Thanks, mate. I'm just disappointed I wasn't number one on board, but 10's good enough. Thanks, Ten, mate. mate. That's my favourite number, number 10. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> Bang, that's it. Woo. That was awesome. That was really good. Yeah.